which day of the week is the best day to make a Jewish wedding? What is the luckiest day of the week to have a Jewish wedding? I'm sure many of you know by now, Tuesday is the luckiest day because when God created the world and Sunday he, said, he looked at what he did and he said it was good, Monday he said nothing, Tuesday he said twice and God saw and it was good. The other days of the week, only once. And Monday, nothing. That since then, Judaism believes that Tuesday is the luckiest day. But really, you can get married any day of the week. Any day is kosher. Just get married. But there is in South America, even on Saturday night, the South American weddings are a whole night. They start 9 o'clock. And they party all night, and by six o'clock in the morning, they go home to sleep. Not like in Cleveland, you know, by eight o'clock, people started to quench, what's with the dessert? I'm tired, I have tomorrow another day, they cannot go. It's a different world. But there is one day of the week, nobody makes weddings. Friday night. Why? Because on Shabbat, you cannot have a chuppah. Jewish law said because a person might forget and sign the ktuba or write something. Therefore, there is no weddings on Friday night. And because there cannot be weddings on Friday night, even the Friday before sunset, you don't make a wedding because it's going to be complicated with the Shabbat and everything. No weddings on Friday. This is true today. Until 100 years ago, I have some news for you. Until 100 years ago, there were Weddings usually in Eastern Europe and really in more, most part of the Jewish world were on Friday evening, right before Shabbat. The chuppah was before Shabbat and the meal, the, the Shabbat meal was the wedding meal. That was the party. Then the most common explanation why it was on Friday night, because it was poverty, the Jews did not have money, and they couldn't afford a party on Tuesday and then a Friday night dinner. Then they combined it. They saved themselves trouble, money. Or that just week I heard from a, a podcast from an historian, a religious historian, that he argues another reason completely. How used to be weddings at these times? How old were the kids when they got married during this 100 years ago, 150 years ago? 200 years ago. The groom was, the boy was 15, the girl was 13, they got married. Everybody knows that when you, have a, when you marry of a 13 and 15, you need to secure their financial survival because they are two little kids, they cannot take care of themselves. You need to raise them until they grow up and then you can talk about, then you can, they can, they can stand on their own feet. Then what was the way to do at that time? One of the families, the parents of the bride or the groom, usually it was the parents of the bride, built, added another room to the house, built it, another room, a, a new room, and the couple used to live in this room, and that's it. And the other family supported them financially. Look, when you make a, chub, a shidduch, most of the weddings were, most of the marriages were shidduch, a matchmaking. Let's say one family lives in Cleveland, the other family lives in New York. And the matchmaker goes between the two families. He has to make it work. What's the job of the matchmaker? To lie. Why he needs to lie? Because everyone thinks that his son and his daughter, they're the best, the most beautiful, the smartest, the most educated. Then the other side has to give him the world. And the same thing the other side thinks that used to go to one side and tell them, oh, the other family is very rich. They will give you everything. Don't worry, everything will be covered. Then he goes to the other side and gives the same story. And finally, the, couple, the young couple gets, um, uh, get, meets each other, they get engaged, fine. He collects his fee and he disappears. Then comes to the wedding, you have to iron out everything. Now it's a real deal. Usually a wedding, let's say again, back to the same example between Cleveland and New York, is to make the wedding and therefore way, let's say in Pennsylvania somewhere. 
They come, they come to the wedding, day of the wedding. That's the, the first time the two families meet, meet each other. Now it's time to sign the contract, the real deal. You put on the money in escrow, something. That every family provided their best negotiator from the family, the toughest guy that can make a good, they can negotiate. These two negotiators used to lock themselves up in a room and iron out the details all the way to the low, low, smallest detail signed the contract with witnesses, and only then they went to the hook. What happened? You know, if every negotiator has to show that he's a bigger chokhem, they argue and argue and argue, and the chope gets delayed and delayed and delayed. Caused a lot of pain to the bride and the groom, to all the people who were invited to the, all the guests, and so on and on. Then they came up with an idea. Let's make the weddings on Friday evening, the chuppah on Friday evening. Then you cannot have the chuppah on Shabbat, that there is a deadline. You must finish fighting before Shabbat because you have to go to the chuppah. Then let's say it takes a chuppah 20 minutes, half hour. Then they know half hour before Shabbat, before Shabbat enters, before sunset. The fight must be the over. And in this way, they can go to the chuppah. That was the normal behavior. For hundreds of years, were the chuppahs on Friday. One time, it was 450 years ago, in the city of Krakow, in Poland. Krakow is a beautiful city. Until today, the Nazis, the Germans didn't bomb it. And all the old buildings and the synagogues are standing there. And there is a synagogue there that stands for 450 years, since the time of the story that I'm telling you. The rabbi at that time, at that time was the Ramon. Rabbi Moshe Easterlich, who later became the codifier of Ashkenazi Jewry. Until today, Ashkenazi Jews go by his ruling. And he was the rabbi. And during his time when he was a rabbi there, it was a chupe Friday evening. He was about to officiate the wedding. But it was a unique situation. The bride was, Irma, was an orphan from her mother for a while. And her father engaged her. And when he engaged his daughter, he promised a, a big dowry to the, to the groom, to the boy. The problem was he passed away, he died before the wedding. A tragedy. Now she has no father and no mother. And the, mad, the brother of, of the mother, his uncle, her uncle, adopted her, took her home as it's getting closer to the wedding. At that time, between the, the engagement and the wedding was a year, even more, because they were young. They came, they came between the, getting closer and closer. And she's asking, what's going to be? Don't worry, we'll walk this out. Don't worry, don't worry, get ready. Everything will be good. She prepared, she went to the mikveh, everything. They came to the, before the chuppet, to the negotiation. After all said and done, it was missing a third of the dowry. And the groom said, he's not going to the chuppah. He was promised. And all the good uncles and aunts who promised the world didn't deliver. Like so many times happens this thing. People promise you the world and they don't deliver. And people started to talk to the groom and the dignitaries and the rabbis said, you cannot do it to our orphan. You cannot embarrass here. And a negotiation and goes on and on and on and on. By the time they convinced them to go to the chuppah, it was Shabbos. Now what? And not just like sunset, you're not sure, it's early, it's late. It was deep in the Shabbos, it was night. The Rabbi the Ramo, Rabbi Moshe Israelish, said he's going to make the chuppah on Shabbat. And he had the chuppah on Shabbos can just imagine one of the most distinguished Jewish communities, the most largest, most, most important Jewish communities in Eastern Europe at that time, Krakow. The rabbi was a young rabbi, great scholar, but a young man is making, breaking the rules, making a chuppah and Shabbat. What is happening here? And everybody was complaining that he wrote a big letter, a responsa, it's called a tshuva, to explain what happened. And he said like this, 
He says, you're allowed to have a chup and Shabbat. The problem is, the rabbi said, because you might by mistake write, therefore they made a fence not to make chupas and Shabbat. So this is the opinion of Rashi. Rashi is the most famous commentator to the Talmud, to the Bible. That was Rashi's opinion. And that was the accepted Allah. But there is another opinion who disagrees with them. The opinion is of Rabbeinu Tam, actually the grandson of Rashi. He believed and he, he held his opinion was that people, we can, you can make sure that people don't make mistakes and there's a lot of people who watch each other, they will not write, and you can make a chup and Shabbat. The aloha was accepted like Rashi to be more on the, on the, on the to, to be more careful and to go on this side to be more cautious, not to, not to make a chup and Shabbat. But he said, well, then it's a time of crisis. I took, I relied on the opinion of Rabbi Tam. What was the crisis? He says, she's an orphan. Now in Judaism, there is an unbelievable sensitivity to orphans. Why? In the Bible it's written, you have to be very careful not to oppress the orphan and the widow, because if they will cry, God says, I will hear the cry right away. In the book of Psalms, God is called Avi Yetomim, the father of the orphans. Every child has parents. But the, the, this, this orphan does not have parents. And God said, I take personal responsibility for it. But in Judaism, orphans is a taboo. You don't touch them. Actually, Sholem Aleichem, the famous writer, was 100 years ago in Europe, wrote an essay that the title is I'm lucky I'm a orphan. Because being an orphan in Shtetl was, you can get away with everything. Nobody will scream at you. You can be wild. You can make tzores. People will take care of you. They will marry you off. Everything is an orphan. That's how the Jewish rachmones, the sensitivity and the mercy was to kids who don't have, do not have parents. But he said, I saw the embarrassment of this bride. I saw she was crying. If I would put off the wedding to Saturday night or to Sunday, it would be a stain on her for the rest of her life that she was not married the normal way. Her wedding was postponed. And he said, and I was more, even more worried that the groom might change his mind by Saturday night. And he finally agreed to do it, closed the deal. That's why he did it. We are now standing in the time of the counting of the Omer. Between Pesach and Shavuos, we count the 49 days of the Omer. During this time, we do not make weddings. Why? Because we are mourning. What are we mourning? We're mourning the death of the disciples of Rabbi Akiva. During, Rabbi Akiva lived during the time of the Romans. A pandemic spread among his students. It was COVID-15. I don't know what. And just a pandemic, just like now. And 24,000 students died in a short time between Pesach and Shuas. Then the Jewish community, the Jewish people are mourning forever the loss of these 24,000 students who were the future of Judaism, a dead generation. But Allah, when, they, when you sort it out, it's 33 days that the student died. They didn't die in Shabbat, in other days. It comes up to 33 days. Then there is, there, there is the Allah is you have to mourn for 33 days. But when is the 33 days? Again, two opinions. Surprise, surprise, Judaism. One opinion says you count from the first day of the Omer until the 33rd day of the Omer. Lag ba Omer. Lag means Lamed Gimel. Lamed stands for 30. Gimel stands for three. In Hebrew, every letter is a number. It represents a number. Then from the first day of the Omer, means the second day of Pesach, until Lag Omer, you cannot do weddings. After Lag Omer, you can do weddings. That's the Sephardi custom. They go with this opinion. There is another opinion that you count the 33 days backwards from the day before Shavuos all the way back to Rosh Chodesh Yair, the second of year actually. Rosh Chodesh Yair is allowed. The, the last 33 days on the 49 days. Then it's where you cannot make weddings. But the first days, 
the first 15 days or 16 days, yeah, 17 days, you're allowed to make weddings. Now, Ashkenazi Jews, because they want to be more strict, they want to cover themselves on all sides. There is one opinion says this is the territory three days, the other opinion says this are the territory three days. Then they, they don't make weddings in general between Pesach and Shavuos. With one exception, Lag Baomer. Lag Baomer is a day that you will be know that the students of Rabbi Akiva didn't die. And it is the outside of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai who said he should celebrate his, day in, his passing anniversary. It's a day of celebration and you're allowed to make weddings. This year, Lag Baomer is a week from tonight. Next Thursday night, that means Friday. Then you can make weddings Thursday night after sunset or Friday. Then this year actually will be many weddings around the world on Friday. Usually we never have weddings on Friday, but this year they will go back to the old tradition of making weddings on Friday. They'll probably be Friday morning. I don't think it will be Friday five minutes before Shabbat, but there'll be weddings on Friday because it's the only day in these 15 days you can make weddings. Why is, what's exciting about wedding? Why everybody wants to be invited to a wedding? And if they don't invite it, they're insulted and hurt. And... Naturally, people, you know, you go to a wedding, you remember when you were standing under the chuppah with your wife and you're so beautiful and handsome and young, and it was amazing. And it gives you good memories. Oh, and you, in your own fantasy, you're thinking still you're standing under the chuppah. You don't look in the mirror at that moment. But the real reason is, Every chuppah is a reflection of the marriage between God and the Jewish people. We got married, we got engaged, we got married on Mount Sinai, on Shavuos. The engagement was kind of Pesach. The marriage was on Mount Sinai. And this reminds us about our relationship between God and the Jewish people. And really many customs in the chuppah are reflecting on, on Mount Sinai event and the giving of the Torah. And every, not only it reminds us but every marriage of a Jewish couple brings us closer to the time of Moshiach, that then will be the ultimate marriage reunion of between God and the Jewish people, when Moshiach will come speedily nowadays.